this particular day, I ran, took off, bow, 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 bow. I'm, I'm getting it, I'm going. I get to that takeoff board, jump, and I remember for a split second, I told myself, you can either, you can either abort mission now, or you can, you can totally land this jump. To Beyond the Ball Podcast. <laughs> what's going on what's going on what's going on ballers and welcome to another episode of the beyond the ball podcast i'm your host jonathan jones and as you all know this podcast is focused on stories strategies and ultimately successes to be a resource and to be a guide for student athletes and beyond and and today i'm i'm really i'm really excited today uh because i because i i connected with this gentleman uh by, by way of a mutual connection uh, by, by way of another high achiever, by way of a uh, j just just a good individual, but man, today I'm t today I'm talking with I'm I'm just talking with somebody who who just knows what success looks like, and I'm I'm, I'm gonna go I'm gonna go ahead and get get into the intro, and uh, this this gentleman here is a, is a four time Paralympic medalist, uh, four time champ, and the world record holder for totally blind athletes. Mr. Lex Gillette. Lex, how are we doing today? I'm doing good, Jonathan. How are you? Man, I'm man, I'm I'm feeling a little bit inspired because like I told you earlier, I, I I was watching your TED talk, man. So I'm feeling really inspired today, man. Just just to just to chat with you today and you know, just to get this opportunity to uh to, to definitely chop it up and you know, just 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 dig in a little bit. Yeah. So I'm I'm, I'm man, good, I appreciate man. you having me on. De definitely, definitely. So, I mean, I gave you the introduction. Is, is there anything that, that I happened to miss? Anything I, I left out, Lex? Yeah, no, you hit it on the, you hit the nail on the head. Yeah, man. Yeah. So, Lex, I'm just, I'm, I'm just, I'm just gonna go, just gonna go right at it and, and just gonna, uh, man, just give you the, give you the opportunity, man, j just to tell like, like a little bit, a little, little snapshot um, because I mean, we we talked about the success, and we talked about some of those things that that you've accomplished throughout your life, man. Yeah. But Lex, I want I want to just turn it over to you, uh, and, and really just give you the opportunity, man, just just to share a little bit about your upbringing, and 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 then yeah, just just go from there. Yeah, I I grew up in Raleigh, North Carolina, so East Coast East Coast kid, and as a kid growing up, I was doing everything that your average eight-year-old kid was doing riding bicycles video games playing outside with friends there was one day that i had come home from school that night i started noticing that i was losing my sight randomly no accident no no nothing didn't fall down on the ground mm. and I told my mom and she was thinking that maybe I had gotten something in my eyes from playing outside earlier that day. We took some water, cleaned my eyes out, didn't, didn't really clear my sight any. So ended up going to the doctor and after an examination, they said that I needed to have an emergency operation because I was suffering from retinal attachments. I had one operation and it seemed like it was successful. I could see well for about three to four weeks. Mm -hmm. Sight was stabilized. After that time, three, four weeks, I started noticing that my sight was, was getting blurry again. And this time, a, a, a lot more than what it was the time before. Went to the doctor. Another examination revealed that I was dealing with retina detachments again. Had a second operation. That was successful. I could see well for another three or four weeks after that time, excuse me, sight was, was, was getting blurry again, went back to the doctor, another examination, doctor say, Hey, he, retina detachments again, that leads to a third operation. So when I say that was the pattern for the entire time that I was eight years old, that year that I was eight, I was in and out of the hospital literally each month and after the 10th operation that year 
the doctor said that there was nothing else they could do to help my sight. And they said that I would eventually become blind. And so when you think about like, if we rewind back to, to when I had that first operation, when you're in that position, of course, you're, you're a little frightened and you're scared. You're, you're scared and you're hoping that it's going to, to happen in your favor and, and the doctors are going to, to fix that issue. Mm -hmm. Very optimistic, I would say, the first operation, sec op second operation, and possibly even the third one. But once you move into operation four, five, and six, now that optimism, it starts to, it's starting to flee a bit. Mm -hmm. And then when you move to operations eight, nine, 10, I think that by that point, subconsciously, I was preparing for, you know what, this may be reality. This is the 10th time that I've had to go to the hospital and be put on the operating table and be wheeled down the hallway into the operating room. And it's just a, it was just a tough time. And, and then when you finally get that verdict from the doctor and he says, Hey, you're not going to be able to see anymore. It's, it's like, wow, okay. Hmm. From there, it was, I would go home, go through my normal routine, go to sleep at night, I would wake up the next morning and, and would see a little less than, than I did the day before until one day I woke up and I couldn't really make out much of anything. And so that is when your reality is just, wow, hits you and and you come to the realization that, man, I can't, I can't see anything. I can't see the, the items that are in my bedroom. I can't see my mom or my neighborhood or, uh, you know, just can't see to read and write and draw pictures and enjoy a lot of the things that I used to enjoy as a kid. So that was, that was definitely a, a challenging time for sure. Hmm. Wow. Man. Like, so, so what was it like going through that space? Like, as you said, initially, you know, you like, like you started off when, when you had the first procedure and you know, you're, you're, you're hopeful, you're, you're, you're really optimistic. And then, as you said, you got down to the, to the 10th procedure. And then the doctor was like, there, there, there's nothing we really can do. I want you just to share just a little bit about like how you shifted perspective, um, like, like towards that 10th procedure. And then just, just understanding that, that life was going to, life was going to look a little different for you. Like, like, can you talk just a little bit about that? Cause man, as I'm just hearing, just listening to your story, I'm, I'm just trying to, just trying to envision like, like what type of mindset you had to have and perspective you had. Uh, j just just in that in that time of your life yeah i think a lot of it is i really leaned on my mom a lot so we even though i was the one going through the through the operations and and dealing with that directly she was she was living that experience as well as as the parent and as the person who was inside of each doctor's visit and each time I would go to the to the hospital to go through an operation, my mom, she's been there every step of the way. And so having to being able to lean on her was was really huge. And there were plenty of times where we would go to the doctor's office and we would walk out and I would be I would be walking behind her and I would be crying, um, you know, largely because you know, nothing was nothing was changing. It didn't really seem like anything was working. And at eight years old, you can imagine, you know, it's 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 already hard for us as as human beings to deal with some of the the pressures and emotions and feelings that we have. And then when you're eight years old and you're you're developing and you're really trying to, you know, figure the world out and figure yourself out to have the the weight of that tragedy i guess i mean that's a very strong word but um you know to to deal with that type of time in life it was 
it was tough for sure. But again, circling back to my mom, I was able to to lean on her and she really helped me to to shift my mindset and to shift my my thinking. There was definitely that time that I had to grieve and get over not being able to to physically see with my eyes. But she helped me to see that there is more to life than what is in front of your eyes. You you have your hands and you have your feet and you have your mind and you have your ears and you have so much more about you. It's not just about what your eyes can see. It's about what your mind can see at the, at the end of the day. And um, after that grieving period, I slowly started to you know, shift to that sort of, to that sort of thinking. And, uh, and it was, I mean, it took days and, and weeks and months mm. and years yeah. to be able to truly get over, get over everything. But, um, it was certainly my mom who, who started to, um, you know, to started that, that shift. And then she was able to find other individuals, teachers and, and, you know, different programs of resources and technology and being exposed to all of those types of things helped me to, to really, you know, push that, uh, push that envelope more and to, to open my mind and open the possibilities even, even more. Yeah. I mean, I really, I really love what you, what, what, what you just said, because first you said that leaning on your mom was, was an individual who helped you begin to navigate you know, just because although it was, like you said, you, you lost your physical sight, um, but then also, you you know, sh she was assisting and, and guiding you through this. But then at the same time, sh at, the, at the time, she didn't have all the answers like none of us do. But, you know, but she sought out some resources. She, she sought out some other groups and individuals, like you said. So to, for, for you all to be able to, you know, have that level of success. Um, just just going through that process. So I think I think that I think that's really awesome. And I think that's a major um, takeaway point there is just understanding that if you're in a place and you don't have all the answers, <laughs> somebody does, somebody <laughs> does, somebody, somebody somewhere, does. Some, somebody somewhere ha has has the answers and uh, definitely can 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 be a resource in, in that yeah. way. And now, Lex, I didn't ever like 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 as, as, as we're having this conversation, uh, and, and when we're just, you know, you're taking us back through your journey. How did you come into, uh, how did you come into competing and, and how did you even, uh, you know, come into to, to long jumping? Like, where did this come from? Yeah, my mom's side of the family is the athletic side. They've all played it all from, from softball to baseball to basketball to you know, your typical backyard sports. And, and so... I was naturally an athletic kid before I had lost my sight. I played, I was playing baseball. And then I also, I wasn't swimming competitively, mm -hmm. but my mom had me, in, you know, I, I was taking, I took swimming lessons. I knew how to swim and I could run and do the cannonballs into the, to the pool and all the other stuff. I could, you know, <laughs> I could swim. And after I lost my sight, it was a matter of me first, successfully transitioning from being able to see to not being able to see and then gaining the confidence to get back out there and maneuver around and navigate around. Um, and one of the interesting enough, one of the things that that really broke it open, actually, you know what, before that, uh, and being from North Carolina, it's, I love basketball. And mm. I had always saw myself as as a basketball player, had I continued to, um, you know, if I could still see and 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 be out there, uh, and and then of course being from Raleigh, you either have to you either like Duke, Carolina, or NC State, mm -hmm. and I'm a big Carolina fan. They've had a lot of the great basketball players come through, and and needless to say, I'm always listening to to sports on the radio or on the TV if I have to. Um, so going back to what I was going to say originally is that one of the things that really broke it open for me, not only athletically, but just from a mental aspect is I had bought this basketball hoop 
for my my closet and it was the typical like a nerf net hanging on mm -hmm. the top of your closet door shoot on it mm -hmm. so in the beginning i was I would, I would shoot the ball, but I never knew when it was actually going inside of the net. So that is, <laughs> I mean, that, that's, that's pointless, right? Like I need to know when I'm scoring and I was, I was trying to figure out a way to adapt this hoop and to rig it up so that I would know when I would score. So what I did was I took a safety pin and tied the bottom loops of the net together so that when, when I was shooting now, if the ball went inside of the hoop, then it would it would stay suspended in, inside of the net and not fall through to the ground. Um, so now it was a matter of me figuring out where the rim was was located in relation to where I was standing in my room. Mm -hmm. I'm really good with with spatial awareness and knowing where I am and knowing where things are. So I, I began to shoot and I could I could make the basket based on you know, where I was standing uh, by the, by my bedroom door or by the bed or across the room by the dresser. And I was creating this, this mental image in my head of, of this court that I had laid out in my room. Yeah. So I began to shoot more and more and more, got more confident. I felt like I could actually see where the rim was. And when I started banging them out, I was draining, <laughs> draining shots. And, uh, <laughs> And that really, that really helped me because at the end of the day, I told myself, if you can, if you can tap into this power to almost, to envision and almost feel as though you can see what is ahead and see where you need to aim and shoot, then what else can you do? Like, where else can you go with this type of mindset and from there it was it was literally just all right i have i have a goal the goal is important but even more than that how can i really lock lock on how can i focus aim shoot and score um and so i've kind of taken that mindset into you know, every aspect of life and and when i actually got into track and field was in high school. It was through a physical fitness test that I had to participate in. One of the activities was standing long jump. Mm. I was really, I was really good at standing in one place and, and jumping forward. And my mom, she kept me in public school. She kept me in mainstream school. So I was used to competing alongside my side of peers. And I was, I was beating a lot of them, mm. like literally one of the best in the entire school. And my teacher at the time, Mr. Whitmer asked me, had I ever heard about the Paralympic Games? And, and at that time, I was like, nah, I never have. And he said, well, it's the highest pinnacle competition for athletes who have a physical disability. And you can go represent Team USA and travel the world, break records, win medals. And I said, well, I mean, who, <laughs> who's going to turn that down? Like, I want to try it out. Mm -hmm. And uh, so from there, it was literally him taking me down to the track introducing me to the event, the long jump, showing me about the, the, the area itself, the runway, how wide the runway is, how long it is, mm -hmm. where the takeoff board is, um, how wide the long jump pit is, how long the long jump pit is. And again, when you circle back to what I was talking about with the, the basketball hoop and knowing where that hoop was in relation to the other landmarks that were in my room at that time I, I was physically I was I was giving myself the ability to imagine and envision what I was dealing with and so in long jump for Mr. Whitmer to 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 show me around that area the runway the takeoff board the long jump hit that was doing for me what I was doing in my room with that basketball hoop. And it, and it got to the point where I literally felt like, you know, I could see in my mind what was going on and what I needed to do, even though I was preparing to compete in an event that I have literally never seen before in my entire life. I've seen basketball, mm. 
but I've never seen anyone long jump before. But the power of the power of visualization is is undefeated. Hmm. Wow. Lex, I see you lighting up when you said the power of visual. I see you lighting up when you say the yeah. power of visualization. Talk talk a little bit more about that. Um and just go 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 a little a little bit more deep deep with that if you don't mind. Cause yeah. the, the way you just lit up when you said visualization. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I it's it. everything. Like at the end of the day, because I mean, that was a saving grace for me coming up. I I really felt disconnected from the rest of the world because I mean, my personal opinion is that we do live in a, a visual world. And although in 2020, there's a lot of changes mm -hmm. that are happening in terms of artificial intelligence and self-driving cars and technology is just, it's incredible right now. But I didn't have the luxury of, of, of having those things in the 90s and early 2000s growing up. Um, so I had to... Um, you know, I literally was was imagining like all of these things. Um, I think that uh, when you talk about vis visualization, for me, that disconnection and isolation from the rest of the world was cured when I came to the realization that at the end of the day, everything that has ever been created and everything that will be created, it always starts from a vision. Mm -hmm. And you see it within yourself, you see it within others before it's actually a, a physical thing. Before it's reality, you have to see it within yourself first. And so I told myself, well, if that's the case, then there's really no need for sight at the end of the day, don't get me wrong. It's not to say that you may not want your sight or it may not be useful, but it's not, it's not 100% required in order to achieve success. As long as you have a vision and you have the ability to visualize and see things beyond the horizon, you can see things before they exist. Then the only thing that you need is a plan to be able to bring that into fruition. And again, you talk about vision. If it's truly, if it's truly something that is a vision, it's not singular, it's not independently for you. It's something that is for a multitude of people. It is meant to transform the landscape of, of communities and society and the world. And so as you continue to, to go to the next layer, then you have to come to the understanding that if you have a vision, you know that you, you don't have to do it alone and you can't do it alone. Vision is all about challenging ourselves to see as much as possible and to do what we can to bring that into fruition. And if it's something that is, if it's something that is, uh, you know, has to be, has the ability to, to really change society, then you know that it's going to, it's going to take you, it's going to take another person, another person, another person. And the beauty in that is that we all have strengths, we all have weaknesses, we all have areas where, where we are, we're valuable at the end of the day. So where I may be weak, and the elephant in the room is my sight. I'm not able to see. There are a number of people out here in the world who can see, a number of people who we align in our thinking and we align in our, in our aspirations. Um, and we put our minds together and our talents together. And where I may not be as, as strong, that person is strong. Where the two of us may not be as strong, there's a third person who brings up that that portion of the equation and you start building and building and building and building and that that vision that was once in your head everybody comes together and, and puts it all uh, we all combine forces and next thing you know that thing starts to roll out and and you literally start to to see what you saw in your mind you begin to see it unravel 
in real time in you know right in front of your eyes man yeah yeah just hearing you say that Lex I'm curious what's your what's your big vision um man I think that uh it's so broad when I say this, but I just want to, at the end of the day, I just want to leave something beneficial on the earth that was not here before I got here. Mm -hmm. And again, I know that's super, it's super broad and it encompasses a lot of things, but I like a lot of things. I just, I just wrote a book in, uh, I wrote it last year and we re-released it in April. It's called fly find your own wings and soar above life's challenges. And um, you know, it's available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, a lot of the, the bookstores and um, on my website as well. But that was, that's a part of my vision. I wanted to be able to tell the stories of the people who really helped me get to this point. Mm. Um, number one, to, to kind of a thank you of sorts and a, a way to give some roses while people can still smell them. And then number two, to really you know, try to give some, some things to readers that, you know, that he or she can use that is, you know, is applicable to gaining success in life. So um, did that. Uh, I want to go to Tokyo next summer. The games were postponed to the summer of 2021 and mm -hmm. I want to to win gold. Um, I want to, I mean, there's just a lot of things, but it all really revolves around leaving positive, beneficial things, resources, a positive presence, leaving, you know, something on this earth um, that that is labeled in that capacity um leaving that here and and kind of making my my own individual stamp dope 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 so you talked about the games and and like i told you lex before before we hopped on i said i, I, I went through and i and I, I watched some watched some clips of you and and, and, I, and i saw you jumping and and I'm gonna, I'm gonna preface this by saying there was a point in my life where i did long jump I never competed at an actual meet, <laughs> but long jump, getting the strategy, like the tactical piece yeah. is not necessarily the easiest yeah. without, you know, taking time and understanding. But now, but now going to you, cause I always, I always just struggled with, with getting that, just getting my footing before I even jump. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Lex, I saw the I, I saw the clip of of you jumping. I'm not sure what particular games it was, but 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 you went in and you you jumped and then you landed outside of the pit. Yeah. Can, yeah. Can, can you can you talk a little bit about that experience? Oh yeah, for sure. So for everybody who's who's listening or watching, the since I can't see what's going on, I have a a person, a guide who stands at the takeoff board and he's clapping and yelling, fly, 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 fly. So that is giving me an audible reference so I know which direction to run. I'm listening to him. I'm making sure that I can lock in to where he is standing exactly. And then I take off running in the direction of his voice. We are, my, my starting mark is about 115 some odd feet away from board. I'm standing there. And so my guide is standing at the actual at the actual takeoff area. It takes me 16 strides to cover that that ground. So I'm listening to him. I'm making sure that I'm, you know, in my head, I'm on the, the correct stride. And then once I get to the 16th, then I'm taking off flying through the air. Each stadium is different because sometimes the long jump runway is beside the stands. Sometimes it's in the infield. You never really know where his position mm -hmm. and where his position dictates how a guide may sound. So they may be echoing when they clap and yell. If the crowd is loud, sometimes it's difficult for you to, to actually hear the guide yelling. And then you have the PA announcer sometimes who's talking. So there can be a lot of different factors going on that impacts your ability to hear your guide. This particular day, I ran, took off, bow, 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 I'm, I'm getting it, I'm going. I get to that takeoff board, jump, 
And I remember for a split second, I told myself, you can either, you can either abort mission now, or you can, <laughs> you can totally land this jump. And the reason that I had questioned myself was that when I, when I left the ground, I felt my body shift a little mm -hmm. bit and I could tell that when I jumped, I didn't jump straight ahead. I, I could feel that I had a slight shift to the right hand side, but we're at world championships. And I'm like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm trying, it's, it's go time. <laughs> and, and, and so I said, I'm going to, I'm going to land this jump. And when I landed, it was on the side of the pit. It wasn't, it wasn't inside of the sand. So that was, uh, it, it was, it was tough for sure. Um, I think that in the heat of competition, you have adrenaline going and I immediately was, was trying to make sure that physically I was okay. I did have a little road rash. I had a gash on my elbow, mm -hmm. but most importantly, I was still able to, you know, I was good. I went to the medical tent and had to get cleared to come back to competition. But a lot of the other things that I was dealing with was just, that's embarrassing at the end of the day. I, I think that I've been on the sideline before and I've heard that happen to other athletes. And I, I would always say, oh man, you know, that'll never happen to me. And it did. And it happened on one of the, the biggest stages in the world where you have a lot of people inside of the stadium watching, you have a lot of people online who are watching. And I think even more than that, when you think about the relationship that I have with, with my guide, he can actually see. And I wanted to make sure that he knew that I still, I still trusted him. I know that every time that I step on the long jump runway, there's a possibility that something like that may happen. Mm. You just never, you never really know. And, and a lot of people would look at that scene, that video and say, Oh man, I, I would never do that. I would never trust that guy again. Or why didn't he tell me to stop and all of these other questions. And, and yeah, you can pose those questions, but I think at the end of the day, also you understand that nothing is perfect and we all have to face some sort of challenges and we're faced with different circumstances. And so in, in the heat of the moment at that time, I was just like, man, let's get out here. I have one more jump remaining. Let's get out here. Let's, let's right this wrong. I don't want me landing on the side of the pit to be the last image hmm. from this competition that, you know, that people see, I still have something left in the tank. And again, I just, I just wanted him to know that, listen, it's, it's cool. Um, and that's very important too. I think that when things happen and, and you understand that your partner in crime, someone who you care about, you understand that they may feel a certain type of way and they may shoulder that blame. But even though I am the athlete and, and my name is the one that's, that's usually, you know, rang across the, uh, the PA, the speakers and things like that. Um, when you say Lex Gillette, you also say Wesley Williams because he engineers a lot of the, success for me as a guy and uh we got out there that last jump of the competition that ended up being that ended up being my best jump of the competition mm. and so it was a nice way to to end a a moment that a lot of people may have labeled you know, a, a, a tragic time um that was my best jump of the competition won the gold medal got the world championship and uh <laughs> no, don't, don't get me wrong, those showers, those showers after that, uh, those, those next few days, they were not, they were not fun, uh -huh. but, <laughs> but, um, but it was all worth it. I think that it was, it was certainly, uh, it took a, a bit of skin, but it's cool. It's, it's a learning experience and we, we grow from, from those, uh, from those slip ups. Yeah, man. Yeah. Man, Lex, I feel man, I feel like our time. I feel like our time is really just just escaping us, man. I feel we're we're going to have to do a do a follow up episode uh, or something, yeah. man. Uh, de de definitely, because uh, man, I'm I'm really I'm really just enjoying our conversation, and I 
and you know I, I asked a few questions but I, I had some more I wanted to ask you but we man we, we're gonna have to come back for gonna have to come back for another episode um, Let's do and, that. And, and, and do a follow-up and you know just just see how everything's moving see how everything's grooving uh, man and just just learn more more about you yeah but man that, that would be my absolute pleasure we definitely have just been chopping it up and everything has been it's been natural that time, yeah. time does not wait for anybody. We've been using it all up. <laughs> Man, no, no, it does not. No, it does not. And, 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 and by you hitting on time, like I told you before, we, we have the two minute drill. Okay. And, 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 and I'm going to put okay. you through the two minute drill and, and what the two minute drill is, I'm going to ask you a few rapid fire questions and uh, we're just going to have a little okay. bit of fun. And just from there, then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll put a bow on it. We'll put a ribbon on it. And then, and, and then uh, I, I'll, I'll talk with you next time, my friend. So are you ready? Awesome. I'm ready. All right, here we go. What do you feel is the most underrated cereal? Underrated cereal? Mm -hmm. uh, Fruity Pebbles. Ooh, my man. Uh, what, what's, uh, what's your favorite food? French fries. Mm. Any, any particular place, French fries? <laughs> Bojangles. Uh, oh, the little Cajun, little Cajun taste. Yes, sir. It. Yeah, you know it. You know it. Uh, your favorite podcast? Favorite podcast? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, it's not going to... I'm going to say Breakfast Club. I wouldn't consider them a podcast. They're, they're a radio show, right? Okay, yeah. Well, I mean, but they do do a podcast. So, yeah, okay. yeah, it, it, yeah, it's considered. Your, your, your favorite pair of J's? Oh... Uh. <laughs> I'm gonna go with the 11s. Which, which ones? Which ones? I'm gonna go with the Space Jams. Classic. Okay. Okay. And then, what, what's what's one tip that you want to leave for a student athlete? Student athletes. I think. Uh, I think that all student athletes should understand that. Um, now, at the end of the day, man, your, your, your mental. The mental aspect of the game is just as important as the physical. You get put it, you get put through so much from a physical aspect, but just make sure you get a chance to rest your mind, to get away from the sport, to, to just do some th things to really, to really recover on all fronts. That's good. That's good. That's good, Lex. That's good. And then this, this is just a bonus question: Who who would you like to see me interview on Beyond the Ball next? Oh, I would like to see you interview. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm blanking on his name right now, but he was a, a, a the long snapper, or yeah, he was a long snapper for. Uh, I want to say it's USC. He's a, a blind kid. Mm, and, uh, I yeah, saw his story. Yeah, mm. yeah, you got to get along. Mm, I gotta, I gotta, I'm gonna find him. I'm gonna yeah. find, why? Cause I remember when I saw his story, oh my goodness, Lex, I was melting, wow, right? man. I was melting. I was like, oh my goodness. Oh, I'm getting the goosebumps now. Yeah. Oh man, yeah, I gotta find him. I got it, that, that, that's good, Lex, that's good. Lex, one, one more time, where, where can people find you? How can they connect with you uh, for, for, you know, speaking? How can they connect with you about your book? and and even follow you on the platforms. Go ahead and share that information with the people now, please, sir. Yeah, my website is lexgillette.com, L-E-X-G-I-L-L-E-T-T-E.com. I am on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at Lex Gillette. And yeah, hit me up. Check out my book is on the site and other, other different items. would love for you to show support. And I'm pretty active on social media, so would love to love to hear from you definitely and if you ever need some inspiration be sure to check out his ted talk be, be sure to check out lex's ted talk Let, lex what, what's what's the title of your ted talk again it's called wings are just a detail that's it yeah man i watched it today like i told you that thing encouraged me man i was like yeah. oh man i'm glad i'm yeah. glad yeah it, it, was, it, it was good stuff it was it was really good stuff man like, like, just like i said before lex we're gonna have to do a follow-up uh, we, 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 of course, we're going we're gonna to stay, stay connected, but my brother, I appreciate you taking the time to, to, to hop on and, and, and to share your experience, to share your story uh, with, with the ballers out there. Man, I appreciate it, Jonathan. Hey, all the ballers out there, keep balling.
Uh, hey, there it is. There it is. Just, just as you all heard Lex say, keep balling. If you're not subscribed to the podcast, make sure you subscribe. Also, we're going to have all of Lex's information down in the show notes. And students out there, always, always, always remember, remember, succeed beyond your degree. Just like Lex said, focus on the mental aspect as well as the physical. But until next time, my friends, this is Jonathan Jones, and this is Beyond the Ball. Thank you.